educated over 50 graduate students and postdocs, and many of those are here in the room, I hope. And uh, he has over 130 publications. Um, when it comes to his science, I would say he is an early proponent of eco-evo, which our, our generation tries to promote as something totally new, but he, he knew that already 40 years ago, that this is how ecology and evolution need to be brought together, um, particularly uh, with his contributions of traits to plan fitness and at the individual and at the community level. Um, he has also made, together with his wife Marsha Waterway and Grand Al, extremely important contributions to community assembly, kind of paraphrasing uh, Hutchinson's uh, homage to Santa Maria or, uh, or Rosalia, why are there so many kinds of species, he asked, uh, they asked, why are there so many sedges? 60 species in only 10 kilometers at four centimeters. So that is an interesting question. And that got him drawn into the debate of neutral uh, theory versus trade-based theory. And I think, although you see the merits of the neutral side, you have been remained, remaining a proponent of trade-based. Equality is a characteristic of my generation. OK. <laughs> <laughs> So finally, I think what is important to mention is that um, here's an example of how you can do basic science and that contributes to applied science and conservation and forest management, uh, forest ecology and so on. But many of his contributions are in this field and they bring just some science to uh, the uh, science of conservation. Um, so Mari is a towering figure and that's how I got to know him first when I started at McGill when I had my job interview. Um, you get to talk to professors, and Marty at the time used to have a, an armchair there where visitors get to sit that is about this high. <laughs> <laughs> you sit there, and Marty sat in his chair that said, already then, 25 years of contributions to McGill. And you look up to him against the window, and he takes in full size, and then you get to answer his questions. That was a little intimidating, um, but ever since we had, had an extremely collegial and, uh, relationship, one that is uh, framed by friendship, I, I would say, and we are really sorry that you are leaving, but you're not really leaving. First, you chose to hand in your resignation for Halloween Day, <laughs> so, five days or so that you stay here, and then you are leaving us as a full-time professor, but you will remain an emeritus, an active emeritus of the Department of Biology, and I know you still have a lot of research and science projects going on that you will do partly in UBC, where you will be moving, and partly here. Um, so we are happy um, to still have you in that function, but we are still sad to see you go somewhat. And now we are really curious to hear what your 40 years of your job. One thing I give up is my salary in the hopes that it will pass to all of you in small increments. Uh, you know, it's really amazing to look around the room, not just because I see so many old faces and friends and people that I'm going to have good memories of, but because it's such a reflection of what a university is, the multi-generational aspect, the thing that makes it so rich to be here. You know, 40 years, you look back, you look forward, you look uh, early in my career to people that mentored me that are now gone, students that joined me early and are still with me that have gone on to jobs of their own. Uh, it's really a wonderful part about being in a university. We're all privileged to have that opportunity. The academics and the support people, the, the culture and the creativity of this place is amazing. And it carries you through your life in a, a very satisfying way. My voice uh, it wavers, but only because I've got one of these bloody colds that seem to circulate when there's lots of students around. <laughs> That's the other side of university life. But I'll persevere, and 
To make sense, I, I've struggled to write this. I wasn't sure quite what I would talk about, really. And I can't talk about all the people and all the things I might like to touch on. But I've tried to glean from uh, my reflection some insights that will be helpful, especially perhaps to students and people early in their career, undergraduate students who look forward to an academic career, and at the same time, a bit of a review of what it's like to be at McGill, to be in Montreal as a researcher, as a teacher. So there's a 40-year span that many of us share, at least all of us, at least in part. And I'll give you my reflection on the situation. But because I took my undergraduate degree in humanities, and particularly in history, I think I want to begin by going back to the beginning which is grade school. It's where we all began <laughs> our academic life. And in my case, it was a Catholic school with a very intimidating, very tall, very old school nun, the type with the black. And all you saw was her face. And she needed that presence because there were 80 of us, right? I'm a baby boomer. First grade, 80 kids, one class, one teacher. <laughs> So she managed that, and the way she managed it was interesting, and I think it had ramifications for my life, really. She spent about a month doing the best she could to teach the whole class, and then she split us into three groups, uh, Robins, Blue Jays, and Cardinals. Well, if you're Catholic, you know the Cardinals are the best. <laughs> and I was a Cardinal. We were a smaller group. After another month, I realized she was basically ignoring us. She put us to one side of the classroom and gave us things to do, but she didn't interfere. She just let us talk to one another and learn together. Some of us knew how to read a little bit, some didn't, and we taught one another. And that kind of individual inquiry was very, very comfortable for me. I never was that comfortable in school in general because whenever you had a teacher who really stuck to the book and had a schedule and made everybody in class walk to that schedule, I got bored. And fortunately, I had good teachers, both in grade school and through high school and into university, who gave me the freedom to indulge that individual inquiry. And really, those are the roots of research. So that's, I think, a preface to what I'll talk about. The other preface is to give some time frame to the younger people in the room. Uh, these people are not part of my first grade class. Uh, that's Watson and Crick. <laughs> Their nature paper came out in 1953 while I was in first grade. So nobody knew that DNA was the genetic code material until I started first grade. I take no responsibility. <laughs> but it, it's, uh, it's a hallmark, I think, of how lucky I was to be in the generation I am. And uh, my luck held through high school. Because what happened, I was, I was born and raised in the States. I was born in Chicago. In Villa Park, that little village that my family moved me to out of the Polish ghetto in the city when I was five years old, uh, was really a peri-urban village. It wasn't a suburb. Suburbs were just getting started. So I could play as a free-range kid on the rivers and in the woods and running around the fields with a gang and learning things, chasing things. We didn't torture frogs. We did try to catch birds. But basically, that free-range inquiry again, that exposure to nature, even though we were only 20 miles outside of Chicago, also ended up influencing the things that I became professionally. So that's another thing by way of preface. What happened then, when I was 10 years old, the Russians put up the first satellite, Sputnik. Some of you will have heard of that, many of you probably. That changed everything, because there was a huge flood of money then. It was the Cold War, and the American government invested in science education. They did a global overhaul of the way science was taught. 
in the high school that I was in outside Chicago, I was fortunate to be using the beta version of the biological sciences curriculum study textbooks, which again were inquiry based, no more learned terms. Basically every class was a little laboratory and you had to take home homework that was to go out and do research basically. So it became part of my early education in high school. Even better, uh, NSF created a program that high school students could apply to to go into a research lab in the summer. And I made an application with the encouragement of teachers who were encouraging me to do so and was fortunate to end up at the University of North Dakota. Number one, I was away from home for the first time. <laughs> with a bunch of other people in the same age, living in a dormitory together, without a lot of supervision. It was really a good summer. <laughs> but what was best about the summer is this young biochemist, Bob Nordley. He had just gotten his position two years before. And he took part in this NSF program and brought me into his lab. And all of a sudden, I had real scientific equipment to work with. And he stood by my side and taught me how to use a spectrophotometer, and at the chalkboard, what, what a michaelis menten curve was. And I just started doing research. And I did a good enough job that he brought me back the next summer on payroll, which I thought was even better than <laughs> some of the other summer job options. And in the end, he put me as a co-author on a paper. So my first paper is in the Journal of Biological Chemistry. And I went off to university thinking, okay, I'm going to be a biochemist, cure for cancer, fame and fortune, bound to happen. Uh, along the way, I also, for that program, I had to write a little honors thesis sort of summary of what I'd done. And I submitted that to a national science competition, became a finalist, met President Johnson, a rather dubious uh, opportunity, but <laughs> what it got me was it got me a scholarship, which otherwise I couldn't have gone to university. I'd come out of a working class family at a time when you couldn't go to university if you didn't have some kind of support. So luck, good fortune, chance, necessity, and history, and chance plays a big role in what all of us will do and have done so far. It's kind of a theme I'm going to try to play with. Chance has always got history woven into it. It's contingent. The odds of what's going to happen next depend on what's already happened. And so just by this lucky set of coincidences getting started, doors opened up that gave me lots of opportunity that I might otherwise not have had. And for that, I'm thankful. Uh, I went to university, majoring in biochemistry, it was a little daunting, number one, because although I was valedictorian of a class of 800, everyone else in the honors biochem curriculum was also a valedictorian, and a lot of them were a heck of a lot smarter than I was. So that was humbling. And then the Vietnam War was ramping up, and things were getting pretty complicated. 1965, 66, 67, pretty quickly I left behind the science, got caught up in the war resistance. Uh, Students for Democratic Society was based in Michigan, it originated in Michigan, had a very active chapter. Uh, I published, uh, wrote for an underground paper, did all the things others I won't go into detail on. <laughs> we did at that time. And it, it was a good time, and I learned a lot doing that. Uh, in that humanities degree, I got the opportunity to do a senior uh, thesis in a history class that I went into the uh, rare books room of the Michigan State Library where they had all the original uh, leaflets and records of the Flint strike, which was the <coughs> auto strike that formed the United Auto Workers. So I was doing research now on the humanities side rather than the science side, and finding it quite satisfying. Uh, 1969, the year I graduated, was a pivotal year for Students for Democratic Society. We had a national convention, uh, Bernadine Dorn chairing it, 
dressed in a very short leather skirt, sitting on the table at the front, trying to convince us all that we should go underground and build bombs and fight the war in the country. And Bill Ayers, Bernadine Dorn, other friends did that. I chose not to do that. It was a time when you had to make some big decisions. I made that decision, but then I had no idea in hell what I was going to do. So what, what did you do in 1969 if you didn't know what else to do? Yeah. You went to San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> no flower in my hair. <laughs> but uh, I went to San Francisco. I lived in Berkeley, actually. I lived with a couple of friends from Michigan State who were studying physics with Murray Gelman. They'd also been in SDS. They'd stayed academic in a way that uh, led them into science. And we lived in a sort of commune, a couple blocks from campus. It was a good year. Uh, I learned a lot. Uh, we went camping once up in the High Sierra. And I'd never been in the mountains, really. I grew up in the Midwest. And all around us were these trees with foliage way up in the air, big old trees, old forests. It was really beautiful in Yosemite. And a lot of them have these strange ornamentations on the trunk. And some had fallen to the ground. I picked some up and I took them back to Berkeley. And I snuck into the Berkeley Library and tried to figure out what this was that I picked up and why did it grow where it did. And I found this little book by Vernon Imagian, The Lichen Symbiosis. About 60 pages, everything that was known about lichens at that time. Literally a complete literature review. Very little was known. I still hadn't figured out the name of this particular lichen, but I knew it was a lichen. And I was making a living of a sort uh, in a fast food restaurant that was run and originated, uh, built by a couple of ex-heroin addicts from New York. It gradually became clear to me that neither they nor the people I was working with had actually given up heroin. <laughs> so it was another one of these pivots where you say, you know, there's got to be a point in life where you get more serious. My parents were urging the same. <laughs> and so I, I wrote to grad school. So I, wrote to, I figured I don't have a chance as a zoologist. I talked to some friends in the university. They said, Try botany, it's easy to get in. <laughs> With a humanities degree, you might be able to pull it off. And of course, I wrote back to Bob Nordley and said, please, for God's sake, help me. I don't want to go to Vietnam. I've got to get back into grad school, get into grad school. I applied to some places that didn't have botany programs. I didn't know. <laughs> there was no internet. <laughs> I got accepted in two places. I had a tough decision to make. I could go to University of Wisconsin at Madison into a botany department, or I could go to UC Davis and get a PhD in turf ecology. I hadn't applied to that, but apparently my application had filtered through different departments and ended up on the desk in turf ecology, and they accepted me and offered me a scholarship. I got a TA ship in Madison, go home to the Midwest, that was where I went. And it turned out to be wonderful. Mikey Adams accepted me. Uh, he was mainly doing aquatic research, but he was getting a lot of money from the International Biological Program, which is one of the first big uh, international programs funding science. And, uh, he was willing to let his students pretty much do what they wanted. I was in a good lab. Steve Carpenter, who later became president of the Ecological Society of America, was my next to me at the desk. And we really got off to a, a very good start. My dad Adams was a physiological ecologist. So physiology to explain where something grew. And he said, what do you want to work on? He said, I've got this like and I carried it with me to Madison. <laughs> and I don't know what it is. And he said, well, let's go down the hall to see John Thompson. He's the North American expert in lichen identification. And John Thompson said, well, yeah, that's a wolf lichen. 
Lotharia vulpina. The Europeans use it to poison wolves when it's ingested. It causes ulcers and the wolves die. And, uh, yeah, if you want to work on lichens, I know just where to do it. The pine barrens of northern Wisconsin. You know, there's that guy, Aldo Leopold, you've maybe heard of. I haven't heard of him then. Just near his cabin is a place where you could do some research. So he took me out there and he walked me around and he taught me some more lichens. And there was a hill about as big and as high as this room, more or less perfectly circular, that had different lichen species in very clear patterns from north to south, east to west, up and down the hill, you could see that the species had distributional pattern. And that's what physiological ecologists basically did research on. Why do things grow where they do? That set me on a course that I've never really deviated from. I managed to pump out a lot of papers because I figured out two things. One, that I read some literature. I was teaching myself again. Physiologic ecologists didn't do replication because they were in the habit of, the instruments were so homemade and cumbersome that to measure a photosynthetic rate, you basically measured one branch on one plant and published a paper on it. I wasn't so happy about that. I knew a little bit and I was learning more about statistics. So I wanted to work not only on lichens, but work on them because they would let me run replicates very easily. They're unrooted. You don't have to worry about maintaining them. You just plug them into the erga and get data. So I had a good combination, and it led to a lot of papers. And at the time, uh, that led to a record that got me a job at McGill. I'm going on too long. I'll try not to uh, bog down in detail. But all that was an important preface. Because a lot of what happened after that is, again, this chance, necessity, and history. Uh, Situation at McGill, uh, starting salary of 16500 it's not actually that bad, but it reminds you what inflation means <laughs> 40 years ago. Now it's uh, up towards 70 grand. Startup support now is a lot larger in general, especially for my cell and electric colleagues. But that was a modest and useful amount of money. They did want me to pay it back, but somehow I... <laughs> and uh, the other thing they gave me, and it was a legacy of the formation of the biology department, is they gave me summer technical help from the people that were teaching technicians. I could do in my summer research program, have an assistant. And Kathy Pryor was the first, and then Ron Kara. Graham Bell and I shared Ron Kara. Some of you will know him. Many of you will know uh, Ron Kara. Kathy Pryor is a professor at Duke University now, and, and quite well known for her work in ferns. The other thing that was different is there's no teaching honeymoon. I arrived with Marsha, she was then just uh, fiancé? I guess we were that formal. <laughs> Anyhow, she came along to get me settled, but she went back to Madison to finish her master's degree. and. Uh, Right away, I was teaching a week later, and I was teaching at Mont Saint Hilaire. It's true, I'd interviewed in January, but they never even told me about the place. <laughs> and I drove out there to start the teaching of the biology of the ecology field course, and I was just blown away. I'd studied enough forest by that time in formal grad courses to realize this place was just a gem, and yet it was being managed as kind of a property, and they were letting the course be taught there, but there wasn't a lot of uh, credibility in the senior administration. Nonetheless, uh, for me it was heaven. It was a wonderful, wonderful old growth forest. And I bonded to it very, very quickly. I took advantage, and this is these things in red are like advice to younger people who are doing, going to start careers. <coughs> Uh, be alert to undergraduates who look like they want to do research and can do research. Lori Helens uh, helped me get tenure because she did a lot of really good work. I teamed up with Jean-Pierre Simon at the University of Montreal. He just passed away recently. But uh, he had some material of plants on a latitudinal gradient. We ran photosynthetic rates on them. She got a nice honors thesis. Uh, she got jobs and went on into a good career and uh, helped me get tenure. This paper 
didn't amount to much at the time, but 20 years later, when global change models needed a calibration coefficient for respiratory patterns, maintenance, and growth respiration, all of a sudden it's shot up in citation rate. Sometimes you do things that have no idea what they're really going to uh, yield. Bob Lemon uh, was an ornithologist who's also passed away. He was a very open-minded colleague. He had a lot of good data, but he didn't know how to analyze it. And I knew some analytic techniques. And I knew Robert MacArthur's tacit papers on niche segregation of warblers in the Americans of Eastern Canada using different strata in the spruce forest. And it turned out his song data, when we analyzed it, showed that the height the birds sang from affected, and the way their songs were structured, affected the ability of their mating calls to penetrate the foliage at different layers in the forest. So that was fun. And just a little side issue. Again, trying to build up a record that wasn't just lichens that would uh, help me get tenure. That's what you're preoccupied with when you start as an academic getting over that first five-year hurdle. Uh, I had had a postdoc from the NSF that turned it into a grant instead. Marcia and I spent a summer up in the north slope of Alaska studying Arctic lichens. Uh, I went up to the Shefferville station. They'd actually sent me lichens for my thesis. Kind of a strange coincidence. And I went up and saw firsthand that I could do a lot of good research there. Michelle Brew, who's uh, joined us, uh, one of my first master's students, uh, picked up some of the problems on the lichen ecology and carried them forward.